I'd like to thank uh, Julian and Andre for inviting me to present uh, in this seminar series. It is my great pleasure and I also appreciate uh, the opportunity to share some of my current research with people from different fields. So uh, the paper that I'm presenting today is about whether the geek platforms should decentralize the dispute resolution. And this is a joint work with my doctoral student at Cornell, uh, Vikat Lee. So uh, this is a working paper. Uh, we are actually revising it right now. So any feedback will be very helpful for us to uh, push the model uh, further. So in this paper, uh, I'm going to focus on a particular but uh, major type of gig platforms, and that is the online labor platforms. So here I'm showing you some um, examples. So usually, uh, basically, any of these um, uh, gig platforms will specialize in a particular type of tasks uh, that you can find on their website. For example, the task rabbit uh, specializes in uh, home services. Uh, and Upwork and freelancer.com uh, specialize in the more creative tasks such as uh, web design or marketing uh, tasks. And there's also the uh, Amazon MTurk. Uh, in there, we can basically uh, do simple tasks like filling out a survey or uh, tagging an image. Uh, more recently, these uh, online labor platforms have actually been growing uh, very fast. And one important reason that workers may want to work uh, on those platforms as a freelancer is that they get to work whenever they want, right? So they actually uh, get to enjoy the uh, flexibility in their work schedules. And also they can um, get access to a broader uh, group of clients. So basically you can work for anyone uh, around the world. And that's particularly true if the tasks can be done uh, online. And there's also some data that showed uh, recently uh, the online labor platforms account for more than 90% of the net employment uh, growth in the United States. And it is also projected that by the year of 2027, uh, more than half of the US workforce will participate in those online labor platforms. And another factor that kind of contributed to the recent uh, growth of this uh, gig economy is the COVID-19 pandemic, right? So with the pandemic, a lot of people actually switched to uh, working online and it's just so much easier for them to find jobs on those uh, gig platforms, okay? So overall, uh, what we do see here is uh, these uh, online labor uh, economy has uh, really become an important part of the, um, the overall economy. But at the same time, uh, there are also problems uh, that could arise, and there are also challenges that these platforms need to uh, manage. For example, quality could be a primary concern uh, for these platforms, because usually the workers there uh, are freelancers, right? so many of them may not be uh, professional uh, professionally trained employees like the uh, company uh, employees. So the quality of their work could be, uh, there could be a question mark, right? And then because of that, typically these platforms will allow the client to reject paying the freelancer uh, after the work is done, right? So if the client thinks the work is not worth uh, getting paid, then the client can actually reject to pay. But in that, uh, in that case, the freelancer may not be happy, right? So the freelancer may actually file a dispute over the payment, right? So that's basically how a dispute could occur uh, in this case. So if you look at these, uh, those online forums where people share their experience uh, from using those uh, online platforms, uh, there were actually quite some uh, complaints about the uh, quality of work and also about the disputes. Right? So many of the clients actually complain that the work quality from the freelancers is actually not uh, sufficiently good. Right? So they think uh, many of the freelancers uh, have failed to meet the required standards. And at the same time, uh, many of the freelancers were also complaining that the uh, clients were being uh, overly picky. Right? So their services are being undervalued to a point where they were practically working for free. Right? So there's apparently a uh, disagreement over the task assessment right? So between the two sides of the market. And when dispute occurs uh, traditionally, the platform is going to be the one that uh, handles this 
dispute case uh, because the platform is making centralized uh, decisions. In this case, uh, in the paper, we call this traditional model the centralized dispute system. Okay. However, there has been discussions and even uh, criticism about this uh, centralized decision-making mechanism because uh, people were saying that the platform may have a conflict of interest. Maybe the platform would want a particular site to win, right? And if this keeps happening, uh, you know, the uh, and if the uh, unfair uh, judgment keeps happening, then there could be a long-term damage to this uh, market. Okay. And because of that, more recently, there's actually a uh, number of emerging online platforms that promise to handle disputes differently. So the idea that these um, emerging online platforms were uh, putting forward is that instead of letting the platform decide who wins the dispute case, maybe we should ask the other platform users to vote on uh, the dispute case. Okay, so that's exactly the idea that they want to um, implement uh, with these uh, new business models. And of course, uh, many of these platforms here are startups and uh, several of them have already been um, in operation such as uh, Crypto Task. And next, uh, let me basically introduce how this decentralized uh, dispute system works. Right? So in this case, we consider it as a decentralized dispute system because the dispute decision is not made by the platform, but it's being made by the individual uh, platform users through a voting mechanism. So in this case, suppose that the client wants to reject paying the freelancer, and then the freelancer is unhappy about it, so the freelancer filed a dispute case. Under the decentralized uh, model, the platform will basically form a tribunal consisting of uh, individual platform users. So they're all gonna be voters in this case. And each of the voters will review this dispute case and then submit their vote. And who wins uh, will be dependent on the uh, majority rule. For example, in the example that I'm uh, showing you right now, there are three voters in this tribunal and two of the voters have uh, voted for the client. So that's the majority. Uh, so the client will win. And what that means is that the client will not have to pay the freelancer, right? But if the freelancer wins, then that means the client will have to pay the freelancer, okay? So this is how the voting uh, works in this case. This, uh, actually this whole uh, voting, you know, decentralized voting idea is not new. In 2007, eBay actually did something very similar by creating the eBay uh, community court. But in that case, the participation of voters is entirely based on a sense of community contribution, uh, but there is no monetary uh, incentive involved. And what happens is that it basically didn't uh, work for long. So after some time, eBay actually uh, terminated that program. And the way, the way that these uh, new platforms are doing this uh, voting model is actually different because they want to uh, create a monetary incentive to drive uh, participation of the voters, right? So they want to give the people some monetary incentive uh, so that they will want to consistently participate uh, in this voting process. And the way that it works is uh, every time a voter, uh, in order for a voter to uh, participate in the voting process, each voter will have to deposit a, a participation fee. And then all the participation fees from the voters will form the reward pool, right? And then after the voting is done, the people who have voted for the majority side will split the total uh, reward pool in this case. Okay. So here uh, you can imagine that every time a dispute case is filed, uh, we will form a tribunal uh, consisting of a number of voters and then uh, there will be a reward pool and then the reward pool will be shared by the people who actually voted for uh, the winning side. And furthermore, to make sure that the payment transfer uh, is credible and trustworthy, these platforms basically rely on blockchain to build this um, whole system. Okay, so that's basically the uh, business proposal of these uh, emerging online platforms. And I guess by now uh, you might have seen a concern, right? Because in this case, 
the voters may be participating on those tribunals uh, for the purpose of earning more money, right? Then it is actually not clear whether the voting outcome would be a good one, right? So whether the voting uh, outcome will be a fair uh, resolution to the dispute. And that is indeed uh, one uh, major concern that these uh, online platforms have uh, thought uh, really hard about, right? So one thing that they want to prevent is the voters collusion, right? So something that should not happen is that, let's say one voter actually knows many other voters, and then this voter basically says, hey, let's uh, all vote for the freelancer this time, so we're going to win, and then we're going to split all the money, right? So these cannot be happening uh, in this case. And these platforms have actually taken several measures to prevent the voters' uh, collusion from happening in the first place. For example, in terms of uh, how to select the uh, voters for each dispute case, these uh, platforms are actually doing uh, selecting the voters in a random way. Okay? And the reason to do that is that uh, each voter will not know uh, which dispute cases I will actually uh, vote for uh, in the future. Right? So that's going to make it very difficult for people to collude uh, with each other. And furthermore, the platforms uh, strictly forbid uh, any communication channel between the voters. And finally, uh, they actually, uh, the voting will actually happen within the limited time window, usually just 24 hours, right? So all these measures are intended to make sure that the voters are not going to find out about uh, each other uh, so that they will not be able to collude, okay? So let's say that this uh, business model will actually work uh, in terms of preventing the voter collusion. However, uh, voters will still vote strategically, right? Because each voter will still need to guess uh, what the other voters will vote. And then uh, the voters may naturally have a tendency to vote for the side that they believe will also win the dispute case, right? So if the voters uh, vote strategically, then um, will this decentralized model still work? In other words, uh, will the decentralized dispute system will achieve justice? And then what will be the condition for this uh, new business model to actually work? Okay, so in this paper, uh, so this is basically how we got uh, really interested in this problem. And what we want to do in this paper is uh, we want to build a um, theoretical model to capture the strategic voting behavior of the, uh, the voters. And then we want to find out under what uh, circumstances will this voting model uh, work. And furthermore, uh, we will compare this new decentralized model to the traditional centralized model. And then we will see uh, which model will be more profitable for the platform. And finally, we will take the perspective of the uh, social planner and we will find out which uh, dispute uh, system will be better for the um, uh, social welfare. Okay, so that's basically how um, a little bit of background for how we got interested in this research and uh, what are the research questions we want to address in this paper. And if there is no questions at this point, I'm just going to uh, continue. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to be very brief about the literature review. I just want to mention that uh, our paper is related to uh, several streams of research. In particular, uh, in recent years, there's actually a uh, fast growing uh, literature in OM, uh, which is the field that I am in. Uh, and that literature is about the platform operations. And of course, there's also the huge uh, economics literature that look at uh, platforms. And our paper is also related to uh, other uh, modeling works such as the uh, voting games and also the quality uh, contracting models. Okay. All right, so now uh, let me introduce our model. So I will first talk about the centralized case and then, uh, so I will show you the model and then uh, show you the equilibrium. And then I will move on to the decentralized model. And finally, I will show you the results from comparing the equilibria uh, under these two models. All right, so the centralized uh, model. So in this case, there's no voting or tribunal, right? So the platform uh, is going to uh, make the dispute decision. 
so basically here we consider a typical platform setting. There is a client and there is a freelancer and they're going to contract uh, with each other. And then the platform is going to intermediate the transaction between the two sides of the market. Okay. Um, so what I'm showing you on this slide is the sequence of events. Uh, I'm going to go over this sequence of events to show you how we model the uh, strategic interactions between the different parties in this uh, setting. And we are going to assume that everyone makes rational and forward-looking decisions, right? So first, the uh, platform is going to decide on the, uh, the fees to charge, right? So F is the dispute fee. That is basically the fee that the freelancer will need to pay if the freelancer wants to file a dispute case. Right? And in addition to the dispute fee, the platform will also be earning the commission revenues from each transaction. Uh, transaction. And then uh, we're going to assume that the commission rate, uh, which is the percentage uh, commission, as an exogenously uh, given parameter. So it's basically de determined by the industry uh, norm. And then after the platform announces its fees, uh, the client is going to offer a contract to the freelancer. So the client will choose a price P, and then if the freelancer wants to uh, accept the contract, the freelancer will decide on his work quality Q. Okay. And then we assume that the freelancer can incur an effort cost to improve his quality. And this effort cost is a uh, convex quadratic uh, increasing uh, function in the work quality queue. So here the alpha parameter is going to be an important parameter in a model because it captures the, uh, the inverse of the uh, skill level of the freelancer. So if alpha is bigger, that means uh, it will be more costly for a freelancer to achieve the same uh, quality level. So uh, that means the, uh, the freelancer pool actually has a lower skill level. Okay. All right, so after the work is done, the client will decide whether uh, she wants to accept or reject the freelancer's work. We assume that the client's evaluation of the work is equal to the quality level Q uh, in the main model. And we also have a model extension where we allow the client's valuation on the work to be uh, different from the work quality, but the, all the insights actually uh, carry through in that case. So in this case, the client will actually be forward looking, right? So she, uh, she will know that if she rejects and furthermore, the freelancer initiates a dispute, then uh, the platform is going to make the decision and then both sides will win with a certain probability, right? So the client is going to take all that into consideration when she decides whether she just accepts the work or actually rejects uh, to pay. And then uh, if the client rejects, then the freelancer will uh, initiate, uh, will decide whether to initiate a dispute or not. And then in the case of dispute, finally, the platform is going to um, decide which side wins, right? And then on the next slide, I'm going to uh, focus on the last stage and then I'm going to show you more details about how we model the platform's decision uh, for the dispute resolution uh, in this case. Um, and I think there's a couple of questions, so I, I'm happy to just uh, answer those before I move on to the, the next part of the model. Okay. Uh, do you need me to read them or are you happy to? Oh, yeah, 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 please do, thank um, you. So Lewis Cabral asked, um, are you modeling platform participation and network effects uh, from your extensive form? It seems like you're not. Hmm. Okay, right. So uh, in this case, um, we, we basically look at a single transaction uh, because this game actually has multiple uh, stages. Um, so, so in that sense, uh, we do not explicitly capture the uh, network effect, right? But we believe the insights will carry through if we um, kind of consider a um, multiple transactions or even a repeated game setting. Um, oh yes, and Andre, Andre uh, responded to that already. Yes, <laughs> okay. All right, so now I'm gonna continue with the uh, centralized model. 
Um, so basically to solve this game, we are going to do a background induction. And then the first uh, step of analysis is going to be the last stage, uh, which is the platform's decision on the dispute resolution. Okay, so let me show you how we actually model the decision making in this case. So we're going to assume that the platform uh, chooses a quality threshold to evaluate the freelancer's work. Okay. So basically, if the work quality is higher than this threshold, then the platform will let the freelancer win. Okay. And then we also assume that uh, after the platform reviews the dispute case, uh, the platform will receive a noisy signal of the freelancer's true quality. Okay. So in this case, the platform does not observe the true quality, uh, and what it observes is a noisy signal X. Okay. So basically the platform is going to compare the signal X to its quality um, threshold, which is endogenously determined. And if X is higher than the quality threshold, the freelancer will win, otherwise the client will win. Okay. So here the epsilon is a um, noise term, uh, which is uh, uniformly distributed between minus one and plus one, and then sigma is the uh, scaling factor. Okay. And next, uh, let's actually look at what will um, uh, the utility function for the platform uh, in the case of dispute happening. So basically, built, uh, based on these decision-making rule, we can calculate the probability uh, for the freelancer to win, and that's the H of Q function. So if the freelancer wins, then the client will have to pay uh, the, uh, the freelancer, and then the platform will be able to extract this percentage commission revenue from the transaction. And at the same time, uh, the freelancer has also paid the dispute fee, right? So this is the revenue that the platform earns in this case. And then uh, if the client wins, then the client does not pay, so the freelancer does not earn the commission, so he only earns the dispute fee. And from this utility function, you can see that the platform may have a conflict of interest. The platform may naturally have a tendency of letting the freelancer win with a higher probability, because if the freelancer wins, then the uh, platform will earn the commission. Okay? But if the platform consistently um, uh, makes uh, biased decisions, then uh, it could actually create a negative uh, reputation uh, damage in the long term. So to capture that, we also have this disutility term in the uh, platform's utility function. And the disutility term is intended to capture this long-term reputation loss if the platform actually makes biased decisions. Okay, So we're going to assume that the disutility is an increasing and convexly increasing function of the difference between the platform's decision rule and the industry norm. So here, basically, we introduce this uh, parameter Y as the industry standard. So what this Y parameter captures is that um, what would the industry norm, what would, be in, uh, what would the industry think uh, that the quality, uh, the, uh, how high the quality level needs to be, right? And then uh, the difference between the platform's threshold and the industry standard will basically measure how much bias uh, there is in the platform's decision making. Okay, so that's the um, platform's utility. And then analyzing this, uh, after we analyze this last stage stage of the game, basically we can go back to the main game and then we work through the uh, entire uh, background induction process. Okay. All right, so next I'm going to uh, show you the equilibrium. So first of all, for the last stage of the uh, dispute resolution, uh, after we solve the game, we find that the platform's quality threshold is equal to the industry standard minus a positive term, right? So that means the platform is going to set a lower threshold compared to the industry norm because it wants the freelancer to win with higher probability. And here the bias is also proportional to the amount of the commission revenue because that's exactly why the platform has this bias. And correspondingly, uh, if you look at the probability for the freelancer to win, there's also going to be a bias term. So the, uh, the freelancer will win with a higher probability uh, compared to what the industry norm um, requires. Okay. 
And then uh, now I'm, uh, if we look at the overall uh, equilibrium of the entire game, uh, so here basically we characterize the uh, equilibrium dispute fee of the platform and also the equilibrium contract price that the client offers and also the quality level that the freelancer chooses. Okay? So with everything taken into consideration, what we have is that depending on the skill level of the freelancer, uh, one of three cases could happen in equilibrium. Okay. So if the skill level of the freelancer is very low, then the freelancer will find it uh, very costly to uh, improve quality, even to a minimum acceptable level. So in that case, the freelancer will not be able to participate. So no transaction happens in that case. And if the skill level of the freelancer is moderate, the freelancer will be able to participate. But in that case, uh, the freelancer will not be able to provide a quality level that is sufficiently high. So what happens in equilibrium is that the client will tend to reject the work and then the freelancer will file a dispute. So eventually it's gonna be the platform's decision uh, for who wins or doesn't win. Right? And then it's gonna happen in a probabilistic uh, manner. And in the third yeah. case, could, yes. could I ask a question again from the chat? Um, sure, sure. Uh, which is from Luis again, who asks, how important is the industry standard deviation assumption for your results? And why isn't reputation monotonic in quality standards? Tonic in uh, quality standards. Ah, okay. Yeah, that is a good question. Oh. Okay, right. So uh, basically these uh, so we introduced this um, parameter of the uh, industry standard to um, kind of capture this uh, long-term uh, damage, uh, the negative effect of the decision-making bias of the platform, right? So um, it is uh, an important component of the model, right? So if we don't have it, then basically uh, the platform will be completely uh, strategic uh, in a way uh, in this decision making. And also we model this as a uh, quadratic term uh, because we want to capture the fact that uh, the damage of this uh, decision making bias can be actually highly uh, convex uh, in terms of the uh, amount of bias that the platform uh, introduces in this uh, decision making. Okay. All right, so I think, yeah, I was here uh, about the three cases uh, under the equilibrium. All right, so these are the three possibilities that could arise in equilibrium. And basically in each case, uh, we have fully characterized the uh, subgame perfect equilibrium. Uh, and here you can see in the case where dispute does not happen, uh, the platform does not earn any dispute fee, right? So uh, what it earns is the commission revenues. But if dispute happens, then the platform uh, will earn the dispute fee. And also the platform will earn the commission revenue with a certain probability. And that is the probability that the freelancer will win the dispute. And finally, the minus term here basically is the, uh, the disutility caused by the bias. Okay. So this is the equilibrium of the uh, centralized case. Okay. And next, uh, let me actually move on to the decentralized case. So the overall game structure is uh, very similar to the centralized case. And the main difference here is about uh, how the dispute is being handled, right? So in this case, the platform does not make any decision there, uh, but the tribunal uh, consisting of individual voters will actually vote on the case, okay? So once again, we're going to use uh, background induction, right? So we're gonna start with the last stage of the game. And here, just to kind of recap uh, how this voting uh, mechanism works, right? So we're going to assume there is a continuum of voters with a total mass equal to one. And then each voter will pay a participation fee equal to $1 to participate. And then the total participation fee will form the reward pool. And we also allow the platform to put in an additional amount of money uh, into the reward pool. So eventually after the voting is done, the voters who have voted for the majority side will uh, actually share the total uh, reward pool. Okay? So essentially uh, what we want to capture in our model is the strategic voting behavior of the voters. Okay? Uh, so what we have here is that 
the voters uh, cannot communicate with each other, right? So they don't know who other voters are, but they still have to coordinate with uh, each other somehow, right? And to capture that dynamic, we adopted the global games framework uh, to model our voting game. In particular, uh, we're going to assume that each voter has a uniform prior on the true quality of the freelancer. And then after uh, they review the digital case, uh, they're going to receive an update, right? So they're going to receive a noisy private signal, uh, which takes a very similar, uh, basically the same form uh, with the uh, platform case, and then they're going to update their belief. Okay, and then after that, they're going to uh, decide whether to vote for the freelancer or the client. Okay, and let me briefly show you how we model the utility of the voter in this case. Uh, the structure is actually very similar to the platform's uh, utility. So there's going to be a term for the monetary earnings, and there's also going to be a guilt term uh, in this case. So the monetary earning term is basically uh, how much money they can earn uh, in expectation by uh, participating into a tribunal. So the minus one term here is basically the participation fee uh, that they need to deposit. And then they can earn money if they have voted for uh, on the majority side, right? So there's two possibilities here. If the majority of the tribunal votes for the freelancer, right? So here L represents the proportion of voters who vote for the freelancer. In that case, if voter I also votes for the freelancer, so that means AI is equal to one, then he's going to share, uh, he's going to obtain a share of the total uh, reward pool and then earn more money than the participation fee. On the other hand, if the majority of the tribunal votes for the client, then this voter will only earn the, um, the uh, uh, reward uh, if he also votes for the client, right? So that's the monetary uh, uh, component. But at the same time, we also want to capture the fact that uh, voters may also care about justice, right? So we're going to assume uh, each voter will incur a guilt um, if they actually vote for the wrong side, right? So what we want to capture here is that let's say a voter has observed a very high quality signal XI, right? So it's clearly higher than the industry standard Y, but somehow the voter wants to vote for the client, right? So Obviously, they can do that to earn more money, but they're going to feel uh, guilty about it, right? In particular, if the XI is higher than the industry uh, standard Y, then uh, this term will be negative. And then here we take the maximum between zero and this term. So the first term will be zero, no uh, guilt there. But the second term will be positive if uh, voter I votes for the client. So AI is equal to zero, right? So in this case, the signal of the quality is actually very high. So the freelancer deserves to win. But if voter I votes for the client, then he's going to uh, incur this utility, okay? And this uh, guilt, this utility also, is also going to increase with uh, how high the quality signal is uh, for the freelancer's work, right? And then using this utility function, we basically analyze this uh, voting game, and then we characterize the equilibrium. And in this case, you may have uh, uh, seen that if everyone just always votes uh, votes for the freelancer, regardless of the quality signal, that could be an equilibrium in certain cases, right? Uh, on the other hand, if everyone just votes for the client always unconditionally, then that could also be uh, an equilibrium in certain cases. So we consider those as the state independent equilibria because um, the signal will actually not matter in that case. But those will be the type of equilibrium that we don't want to uh, want to have, right? So for this uh, voting model to work, uh, what we need to have is a state dependent uh, Bayesian-Nash equilibrium. And we actually proved that uh, there always exists a state dependent uh, Bayesian-Nash equilibrium. And in this case, uh, each voter will uh, decide, uh, make their decision based on the quality signal, okay? So if their signal is higher than the industry standard, then they vote for the freelancer, and otherwise they vote for the client. 
And more importantly, we also uh, characterized a condition for this state dependent equilibrium to be the unique equilibrium of the voting game. Meaning that if this condition is satisfied, then the state independent equilibrium will, will actually not arise. So the only equilibrium that survives is going to be the, the good kind of equilibrium that we want to have, right? And what this condition requires is that the sigma is uh, sufficiently large, right? So in this case, the sigma captures the degree of heterogeneity uh, across the voters, right? So the takeaway from this result is that uh, in order to make sure the voting outcome is going to be fair, the platform should actually make sure that the uh, voter pool is sufficiently diverse, right? And the intuition is that if the voters are quite homogeneous uh, with each other, then it's going to be very easy for a voter to guess what the other voters are going to vote, right? So the state independent equilibrium will be more likely to happen uh, uh, in this case, right? And that's not the kind of equilibrium that we want to have. But if everyone is very homo uh, heterogeneous, uh, then it's gonna be a lot harder for the voters to actually um, converge to the state independent equilibrium, right? And, and we also think that um, this actually does not conflict with uh, how these online platforms are actually uh, implementing this voting mechanism, because uh, like I mentioned previously, they actually select the voters in a random fashion, right? So that could naturally guarantee that there will be a decent amount of heterogeneity uh, or diversity among the voters. But if the platforms actually select uh, voters based on uh, whether the voters experience would fit this particular case, then that actually might not be a good idea because then you would actually make the voters more homogeneous with each other and then the voting mechanism would actually, could actually uh, fall apart. Okay. Could I put another couple of questions? Uh, yes, please. Um, so firstly from Jacques Crimer, he says, surely in practice, platforms pay the voters to provide them with an incentive to examine the case carefully. Um, uh, this could be modeled as a cost of information acquisition. Uh, this doesn't seem to be in the model, and could you explain why? And then there's, a, I think, a related question from David Saland, who says there does not seem to be any mechanism to induce voters to put much effort into getting good information, only the cost of regret, which could be quite small, um, and is not related to the value of a good decision. Uh, could you comment on this? Mm, right. Yeah, those are very good questions. And that's actually one of the things that we are uh, working on right now. Yes. So in the model that I just showed you, uh, we didn't uh, incorporate the uh, effort of the voters to actually, uh, let's say, reduce the uh, noise of the um, the signal, right? And that's actually one thing we're working on right now. But I think something that could be interesting here is because we find for this equilibrium to be the uh, good kind of equilibrium, uh, we actually need the sigma, uh, the degree of noise to be sufficiently large, right? So that means it may actually not be a good idea that uh, everyone actually um, uh, has uh, homo more homogeneous uh, signals uh, after they review the case, right? So of course, uh, we could also think deeper in terms of uh, whether the heterogeneity among the signals is actually caused by how much effort they incur to review the case or what is their true uh, preference, uh, right? So those are actually the things that we are um, looking to uh, capture in the model right now. And then thank you for the uh, wonderful questions, okay? All right, so I think I'm- uh, I have a few minutes left, uh, if that's okay. Okay, yeah, so there's another question. If, um, mm, right, so if sigma is extremely large, then that means, uh, yeah, it will be very, very noisy, right? So the, uh, it's not going to be informative, right? That's true. Okay, uh, I see that uh, I don't have much time left. So in the interest of time, let me basically uh, go over uh, the main results, some of the main results when we compare the two systems, okay? So basically, uh, first of all, under the decentralized system, we also characterize the entire uh, the equilibrium of the entire game. The structure is actually similar to the centralized case. So either the transaction does not happen or transaction happens 
but dispute also happens or transaction happens, but dispute does not happen. Okay. And then when we compare uh, these two uh, systems, one main effect that we see is that uh, the decentralized model, right? So it's going to remove the decision-making bias of the platforms, okay? So in this state-dependent equilibrium that I just showed you, uh, the decision of the voters is actually based on this uh, industry standard, right? So everyone will basically vote according to the industry standard. That means the bias of the platform's decision-making is improved, uh, is removed. And what that also means is that the tribunal is going to set a higher quality standard for the freelancers, right? So that will actually incentivize the uh, freelancer to actually work harder and improve the quality uh, in equilibrium. And correspondingly, the client will uh, actually be willing to pay a higher contract price. So the platform could actually extract more commission revenues from the contract price, okay? However, uh, these uh, phenomena will actually mean different things for different uh, freelancers, right? So overall, the change is that the tribunal is going to set a higher standard and then the freelancer will have to work harder. This may not be an issue if the freelancers have a higher skill levels, right? So they can afford to work harder, right? And then offer higher quality and then the platform can also earn more commission revenues in that case. So that is why uh, when the freelancer skill level is sufficiently high, the decentralized case should be preferred by the platform. But if we are dealing with uh, the lower skilled freelancers, right? So having a higher quality uh, standard will actually make them, uh, make it even harder for these lower skilled freelancers to participate, okay? So what we find is that under the decentralized model, uh, more of the lower skilled freelancers will actually not be able to participate, right? And then even for the ones that do participate, the platform will not be able to extract uh, much surplus from them. But if the platform uses the centralized uh, decision-making model, right? So he can actually control the quality threshold, right? So if the freelancers have lower skill levels, then the platform can also set a lower uh, quality threshold. So in that case, more freelancers will be willing to participate and the platform can also extract more surplus from those um, lower skilled freelancers, right? So that's why uh, the centralized case will actually be better for the platform if uh, the freelancer has a lower skill level, right? So uh, basically this is this a single threshold uh, result is uh, of the result that we obtained regarding uh, which system should be preferred by the platform, okay? And a couple of takeaways is that uh, in order to uh, make the decentralized model work, it will be important for those platforms to make sure that the skill level of their freelancer pool is sufficiently high. Okay? Some of the things that the platforms could consider doing is that uh, maybe they could require uh, certifications for uh, professional software, for example, and they could also consider providing training sessions to uh, improve the skill levels of the freelancers. And another factor uh, that's related here is if you look at uh, what's happening over time, uh, one thing that we observe right now is a lot of the professional employees are actually switching to those uh, online labor platforms. And if this keeps happening, then over time, the overall skill level of the freelancer pool will actually keep increasing. So that means uh, in the future, the, uh, the decentralized model will be even more likely to be the optimal solution. And finally, uh, although I didn't show you the detailed results for the social welfare analysis here, I do wanna mention that uh, because uh, the decentralized case is going to set a higher quality standard, uh, what we find is that the equilibrium quality level is actually closer to the socially optimal level. So that means if the platform uses the decentralized model, then its incentive will be more aligned with the um, social planner. Okay. And finally, uh, the, those gig platforms have been criticized to behave more like a monopoly, although they claim to be running a decentralized uh, marketplace. And they also believe that decentralizing the dispute resolution can be uh, one step to move those platforms closer to uh, being a true sharing economy. Okay. 
All right, so I'm basically going to stop here uh, just to uh, briefly summarize um, some of the main findings from this paper. Uh, we find that the decentralized dispute system uh, indeed can work uh, and then provide a fairer uh, dispute resolution, but that only happens if the tribunal is sufficiently diverse. Okay? And another thing that the platforms will need to be very careful about is to make sure that the freelancers are sufficiently uh, highly skilled. Right? So only by making sure of those two things can the platform make this new uh, decentralized model work. And in that case, uh, the decentralized system can also align the platform's uh, incentive with the social planner. Okay, so that is my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you uh, very much for listening and for all the wonderful questions. Uh, I, I think now I should pass it on to uh, Andre for, for the discussion part. Yes, right over to Andre, please. Sure, uh, I'll try to keep it brief so we have time for, um, uh, for Q&A. So first thing, I think it's a super interesting paper. I mean, the topic, I just want to emphasize this, the topic of decentralization of platforms, I find it like one of the most interesting current topics, so both in the real world, but I think it should become like a super like rich and interesting research topic. And as far as I know, I think this is uh, Yao's, I think Yao's is one of the first papers to look you know, seriously with a model at the trade-offs that are involved in uh, decentralizing let's say certain governance decisions. So they're focusing on dispute resolution, but of course you can, you can imagine platforms decentralizing other governance decisions. And the idea of decentralization is pretty simple, right? I mean, so instead of the platform controlling and deciding everything is to essentially like delegate some of those decisions to a randomly chosen uh, subset of its participants. Now, I think it's important to ask here, so I just want to emphasize this here because it's a, it's a theme that will come, uh, I'll come back to in my comments. Um, so you, it's an interesting to ask, like, why do platforms do this? So yeah, there's this, there's this notion, you know, there's sort of like PR notion that platforms decentralize because you know, they, they're perceived to have too much control. But I think more practically, decentralization also helps, at least in some circumstances, better align decisions with the welfare of participants. So I think it's useful to think about this because, I, so yeah, I don't think you necessarily have that mechanism per se in the model. So I'll come back to this. And by the way, the, my job is made a lot easier by the comments in the, in the, in the chat, which is basically kind of what I'm getting at as well. All right, so there are two main comments that I have. And again, they're kind of been hinted by Luis uh, and, um, and Jacques in, in the chat. I just wanna emphasize those. So the first comment I have is about the voting mechanism. So you're kind of you're assuming that the voting mechanism is this like the so the the voters pay, post a bond and if you're on the winning side quote unquote then you win. I think it's important to justify because it's not entirely obvious why that mechanism is ideal. I mean it's not entirely clear that that's the ideal mechanism. And in fact, I actually looked out of curiosity because I was super curious about the examples that you had. And it's kind of interesting the examples of decentralized dispute resolution that you have. There are these very obscure platforms. Honestly, I try to go on the websites for a few of them. Some of the websites don't work. Some of them don't have websites or they haven't, up, basically they haven't tweeted since 2018. They look a little bit, I don't know, they look a little bit sketchy, which by the way, I know is the nature of like blockchain decentralized platforms. They're very new, but I think it's, it's interesting. To, so there's one that I know I can recommend. There's a very successful freelancer platform called uh, Brain Trust, which you should look at. Now, the interesting thing, I, I looked closely at the dispute resolution they have. It is decentralized in the sense that they get third, like they get members to vote on disputes. However, this is where uh, this is the, the, the main point about the voting mechanism I have. It's not like the, the workers have to post a bond. It's basically they do it out of, out of their own free, like, you know, whatever they want to participate on the platform. It's in their best interest to make sure that, you know, that disputes are solved in an in a, in a equitable manner. So more broadly, I do think you're right. I mean, I think it's interesting, the mechanism of, so, you know, you get, so you post a bond and if, you, if you're wrong, then you lose it. If you're right, you basically share, share in the winnings. I can see an argument for that. And the strongest argument is probably like, well, it incentivizes people to take voting seriously, like to consider cases carefully because you don't want to be wrong. There are two issues with that. Number one, if we take this seriously, so this is Luisha's question, I, don't, I didn't see that you have voter participation, right? So it should be incentive compatible for voters to want to participate in expected value. Now, you don't have that because 
in your case, like voters have, there's the financial reward, plus there's a subjective element, you know, I don't want to feel guilty about getting things wrong. But I think it's useful to think about like there should be like if it's truly monetary, like if it truly really matters, then there should be some participation constraint. Uh, and this wait, the second thing that I wanted to say here. Um, right. So the other thing is, in reality, I think the voters are not exactly posting bonds. I think more more likely what's going to happen, especially with blockchain enabled platforms, is they will be paid or rewarded in tokens. And I think this is important in your model. It's basically lump sum payments. I think the, the, the advantage of tokens is it basically aligns voter participant incentives with the long-term incentives of the platforms. When I think this is the sort of the mechanism that I think you want to introduce in the model. And that brings me to the second point, which I think is sort of the, the crux of the, like, the thing I would sort of like focus on the most to sort of to improve the paper. So right now, the... Um, so both the platform and the jury members, if it's decentralized dispute resolution, the way you sort of get most of the action is, you know, Luis's first question is like, well, you have this um, kind of exogenously given preference for not deviating from some industry standard, right? So like the platform doesn't want to get, get a foul of industry standards and the, the voters, they, they just, they don't want to get things wrong for, for fear of being, uh, for feeling guilty. I think it would be a lot nicer, a lot more realistic and you know, a lot more convincing if you can introduce a mechanism of reputation where basically the incentive to get things right in terms of voting basically comes from the fact that it has a feedback effect on the reputation of the platform. I actually don't think it's that complicated. So I was thinking, how would I do that? We can probably maybe do something like two periods and say something like if the, if the client gets, feels like they're being wronged, they will be less likely to come back in a second period and vice versa. If the, um, if the freelancer is, is wrong in the decision, then they're less likely to come back in the second period. And th this way you have this, like you will have basically the incentive to get things right is going to be endogenous as opposed to this exogenous parameter. And I think it will make it a lot more, a lot more realistic and a lot more appealing. Um, anyway, I can, so I can go on, but just in the interest of time, let me, let me pause here. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of interesting discussion. I honestly, I, so I love the topic. I think this is like, it's awesome. This is one of the first papers to do this. There's plenty of things that you have, like, and the results are very nice. You can make, you know, you can probably make some tweaks to make it more, you know, uh, more convincing. It's like, there's like, really, really good topic to be working on.